Uh, Dr. Clevis is a medical oncologist who specializes in the care of patients with head and neck cancer. He is a global leader in head and neck clinical trials and will provide an overview today of some of the ongoing research that's being done in the head and neck center here at Stanford. Dimitri, thank you again for being part of our day. There we go. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so we heard about a lot of people who uh, put this uh, meeting together. Who wasn't highlighted was Professor Starmer. This didn't exist before she came here. She's put this together. She has a large number of people helping her. But uh, Heather, thank you for doing this. And I'm going to take my mask off. I've had COVID already. I've been vaccinated four times. And I'm not sure what else I can do to protect myself. Um, so I'm going to uh, try to keep this light and futuristic. So this is something I downloaded from the web a while ago. I've used this slide before. You guys may have seen it. But you know, what does Stanford mean? What's the difference between here and a small, excellent community practice? What's the difference between here and other lesser institutions, you know, places like Harvard? Um, and, and the difference is, I think, that people think crazy future stuff, and then they go out and pursue it. And this was actually something that's circa 1975, the idea of putting some big civilization into orbit and populating it and making it terrestrial and all that. And you know, I mean, leaping forward now, I mean, we're seriously talking about doing research to colonize Mars. I mean, that's sort of amazing. And people at Stanford were thinking crazy, wacko ideas like that many, many uh, uh, decades ago. And so some of the things I may talk to you about, um, I think some people think, wow, how are you going to do that? Is that kind of crazy? Well, yeah, because crazy is good. So a couple of questions. I'm going to pose these as questions. So this is one of the issues that we face is people come in with big cancers, in this case, squamous scan, uh, skin cancers, that for one reason or another can't be removed. I'm going to warn everyone, there are going to be some graphic pictures. I will give you a heads up when they're coming for those of you who want to look away. But unfortunately, this is the nature of our business and our research. Well, what if you could uh, do something about them? So this is a neoadjuvant approach. By the way, a lot of the stuff I'm presenting is not primarily my work. It's work of our colleagues. In this case, this is Vasu Devi, a head and neck surgeon here. He said, you know, you're giving all this immunotherapy, you medical oncologists, and in some cases, things shrink dramatically. Why don't we do that before surgery, and maybe it'll be uh, an easier problem to deal with? So we've got drugs that were approved for people with recurrent disease, but what about giving things beforehand? And so uh, Dr. Devi actually has two trials on this. One he wrote. Another is a large cooperative trial that uh, uh, he's uh, working in collaboration with Pharma on. OK, first alert, graphic pictures. So this is a scalp. This is a scalp with something on it. This is what used to be on that scalp. The difference between the larger tumor and the follow-up is drug therapy. So that's a huge success story. That is a tumor that is much more um, uh, amenable to resection and much easier to get around. So that's one example of a success of asking a crazy question. Look, let's give the drugs first rather than just operate on it. So here's another example. Here's a, a, a lesion in front of the ear, very problematic in terms of size. Maybe if you wanted to operate on it primarily, you'd have to um, uh, remove part of the ear. Uh, this is without any surgery, what you see here, purely drug effect. So Vasu wanted me to show you these data. I'm not expecting you to digest the, the table in detail. But basically, about half the people treated in uh, trials like this have dramatic responses, which have uh, um, remarkably changed what needed to be done afterwards. What do we want to do? We want to figure out, why aren't the other half responding? Maybe uh, we'll find that out by examining tumors. Maybe we'll find out by markers in the blood. But that's what the sort of thing that we're looking at. 
and maybe we're going to come up with even better uh, treatment. By the way, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it, but this wasn't intense multi-agent chemotherapy that made people sick. This was immunotherapy, which is tolerated pretty well in most people, a whole topic I'm not going to delve into unless people want to talk about that uh, when I'm done with my talk. OK, here's the other big question. Here's something why I didn't become a surgeon. There's many reasons I didn't become a surgeon, mostly because all of the trainees were sleep deprived and they put laws and rules in place to prevent that now. Yay. Um, but how does a, a surgeon figure out what to take out? You know, right now in 2022, that is still a huge challenge. Again, alert, some pictures coming. So what we have here is a cartoon of the area of a neck where a lymph node dissection is going to be. Next to that is an actual picture of a lymph node. I mean, I see a bunch of red stuff there. I can't see tumor. I can't see lymph node. How the heck does she or he know what to operate on? I don't know. So what if? you could give something that only tagged lymph nodes that had cancer in them that kind of glowed in the dark. You shine a light on it, and it shines back on you, and it shows you where it is. What a crazy idea. Uh, how many people grew up in an area where there were fireflies? Right. Yeah. So how cool was it? You ever take fireflies in the jar, shake them up, and they glow? Well, these are the kind of uh, chemical substances we're talking about. You attach that to an antibody that binds exclusively to tumor. And guess what? You can actually see it. The third picture, that black and white with that white glow, those are the lymph nodes that are involved with cancer. And we know that because this patient got an injection with something a couple of days before surgery, and those antibodies are only bound there. The final picture showing the green is you can actually overlay those uh, and see, aha, this is what I need to make sure I remove. This is not something that anyone's been able to do with any reliability. There's some things called sentinel lymph node dissection. In that case, they inject nonspecific dye that travels to lymph nodes. This is in use in melanoma and breast cancer and head and neck cancer. But this is tumor containing lymph node specific. You can also use this to ask other questions. A little bit technical here. Is my mouse uh, up there? Yeah. So this is something that you get out of a tumor after you've removed it. This is a slice of a tumor stained with something and then looked at under the microscope. And what they're looking at is something called EGFR. And you can say in this tumor lump, all of that stains positive for EGFR. This green is a little bit different. This is asking the question, when we gave the antibody to the patient while the tumor was still in the body, how deeply did that antibody penetrate? Whoa, it didn't really penetrate to the center of the tumor at all. The antibody is only at the edge, using the same glow-in-the-dark technology that I'm talking about. So here we have the ability to study the question when we give an antibody, does it actually get deep through and through the tumor, or is it just on the surface? This has been studied in lymphoma, leukemia, liquid tumors, but this is the first sort of data ever in uh, solid tumors. Way cool. Another example. So again, why Dimitri isn't a surgeon. If you look at this picture of the tongue, you say, oh, yeah, there's a picture of a tumor. Well, it was so obvious that that's where the tumor is, someone had to draw a black line around it to show you, because I can't tell where that tumor starts and stops. So again, the patient given a tumor-specific dye. Now, what they call open field means they turn off the lights, they shine a special light in, they can see this bluish-greenish light reflect out actually in the operating room, and you can get a sense of where you need to operate on. Above and beyond that, when you take out a tumor, this is a different tumor, but it illustrates the point. When you take out the tumor and then you put it into a special closed field, which means sort of a special photographic box in the uh, operating room, you can scan it for that dye and see, yeah. By the way, I hate the expression 
I got it all when it comes from a surgeon. Because what they mean is, I think I got it all to the best of my ability to see it. But this is a tool to help them see it better. They put it in this box and they say, yes, I have a higher degree of confidence that everything that was tagged is out. Here's just another example under uh, a closer microscopic view where you might ask the same question. Tumor under the microscope, uh, closed field uh, staining. Again, work done here. Yeah, I contributed to part of this work because I gave the uh, drugs, but really this is driven by this uh, group of people. Other ways of doing this. So this is another overlay um, that you can visualize during surgery. Another example really of what I showed you. You look at this picture and you say, yeah, I see the lymph node, but is that involved? The answer is yes, because it's taken up the dye. Here's the overlay, and here's what they call a heat map, really a, a helping uh, guide. The problem with that is it's all superficial. As you know, you take fireflies, you, you know, put them below a book. You can't tell that the firefly is glowing through the book, right? I mean, it's just light. The book blocks it. Well, tissue blocks light. So everything I've shown you so far really only works to about a depth of about uh, half a centimeter to a centimeter. But what about deeper? How do you do that? Well, instead of tagging a fluorescence molecule to a tag, you tag a piece of radioactivity. And that's what's done here, what I call the, the deeper approach. This is also championed by uh, Eben Rosenthal, who used to work here until he left us for Vanderbilt. Good for Vanderbilt, bad for us. Uh, and this project's been taken over by Fred Bake, another one of the surgeons. So here you have a, a cartoon of an antibody, the thing that goes to the tumor, tagged to a piece of radioactivity. You get put in a scanner. You see where that is. You try to uh, home in on the radioactive uh, areas, and you remove those, and you look at it under the microscope. So that's actually uh, just starting to be done. Again, it's going to guide them. For those of you that have heard about, again, sentinel node uh, biopsies, those dyes are all nonspecific. So for the first time, we're starting to explore cancer-specific marking of tumors and lymph nodes. So I think the idea of when the surgeon comes in, and I love making uh, uh, fun of my surgical colleagues. No surgeons are here today. Good. So. Um, so, you know, when they say, I got it all, you know, now we'll have a better sense of truly getting it all. Because despite all my fancy tools and drugs, despite radiation, still uh, in this era, if you can get it all, it's worth it. So let's talk a little bit about uh, survivorship. Dry mouth. Our previous speaker, you know, was up here sipping away. Um, and, you know, this is a huge problem. How big of a problem is it? It's really a almost universal problem in patients who have been radiated for head and neck cancer. So, you know, I don't know of a single head and neck patient that I've participated in the care of who's had radiation to their mouth and throat area who says, I have no long-term side effects. It's just uh, unheard of. Dry mouth is a big one. So this is from uh, my colleague Quinn Lee and some of her research. So, what they've discovered is that there are stem cells in the salivary tissue which can be stimulated. And they have found a drug called D-limonene, which can actually stimulate that through a particular protein. So that's really cool. If you can stimulate sal salivary glands with a drug that you've identified that you can give people, maybe that'll help. So she's done some experiments with mice. And what I want to show you here is that the red line on these graphs, higher is better. The red line is mice who got delimining during their radiation treatment. The black line is the line of those that just got radiation. And you can see that uh, saliva production was improved. One of the things you've got to be careful about data like this, uh, a lot of people measure saliva production, but it doesn't correlate all that well with how patients feel. So a lot of t uh, studies have shown, oh, yeah, your saliva production is better on drug X, but you feel no better in terms of function. So it's really important to tie actual measurement with quality of life. And this is just a, a demonstration that of those stem cells that have been um, uh, identified that can be uh, grown. So there's another uh, separate uh, work that says maybe we should harvest those stem cells, radiate them, and then give them back their stem cells. 
Uh, that's another project I'm not going to talk about today. So delimonene, this is a project discovered with research in a Stanford lab here by Dr. Quinn League and her colleagues. And she has taken this through. And now, as a group, we are starting to give this to real people who are getting radiation. Basically, we start uh, the de uh, uh, limonene around the time radiation starts. And we continue it for uh, many weeks after radiation. And we ask the question, what's up with their saliva? What's up with their quality of life in terms of a uh, oral dryness uh, specific study? This has really just started. We're just getting off the ground. No results yet, but uh, this is really cool stuff because this is something that we really have not made a whole lot of progress in is helping people with their dryness. OK, that's one, xerostomia. That's a big deal for cancer survivors. What about other challenges? Well, there's lymphedema. And uh, Professor Starmer and her uh, colleagues have a particular interest in that. I'd like to show you some uh, pictures of what lymphedema is. So these are all pictures, by the way, downloaded from the web. So I don't know who this gentleman is. I don't think any of us do. But he's put himself on the web. So it's in the public domain. So I'm not revealing his identity. Uh, Pre-radiation, this is what a voice box looks for. Nice, skinny, delicate vocal cords, nice pink structure around it. After radiation, everything is swollen. Why? Because a lot of scarring is going on in the neck, preventing uh, fluids from draining. And in many people after radiation, for those of you that have been through this know that it often doesn't happen during radiation. It happens after radiation. You get this uh, swelling. And that swelling can interfere with, A, your cosmesis. You, all, you look like you have a double chin all the time. B, it can have uh, implications for uh, swallowing, speaking, uh, eating. What can we do? Well, we want to understand how people cope with this. We want to understand how it affects swallowing. Um, we want to be able to measure exactly uh, quality of life instruments, or we call them, in terms of this. Because again, looking at someone who's swollen and figuring out how they're impaired by that are very uh, different questions. Because there's some people who can look quite swollen who tell you, yeah, I just had a piece of French bread, no butter, no nothing, swallowed it, no problem. There's other people who look minimally swollen who can't cope with that at all. Um, in terms of attacking this problem, I can say there are some treatments. They help. They are a chronic in nature. We heard about uh, muscle exercises. There are exercises that can be done for lymphedema, uh, which help as well. OK. Uh, coming a little bit, uh, focusing on some of the work that I do. So the two most common uh, head and neck cancers uh, in the Bay Area. One is HPV-related oropharynx cancer. Uh, we're in a part of the world and in a part of the country that smokes a lot less than in other places. So tobacco-related cancers are becoming less and less common in our group. But there's something uh, else that I'd like to point out, um, nasopharynx cancer. That space behind your nose, above your throat, above your palate. This is a common cancer in the Bay Area. Why? It's all about perspective. Football. Yay. Go Stanford. Right? That's football to some of you. <laughs> this is football to me. My daughter played soccer ever since she was young. If you go any other place in the universe other than the United States, football is this. Why do I point that out? Because it depends upon where you are, and you have to look at your local community in terms of what's common. This nasopharynx cancer is really pretty darn rare worldwide. Less than one person in 100,000 gets it. And that number is true for the USA as a whole. But wow. What if you're from Guangzhou, China, which is, by the way, very close to Hong Kong, that uh, region of China along the southern coast? Y your, your likelihood of getting nasopharynx cancer is much higher, as is true in Singapore and Vietnam. But we're a Pacific Rim city here. We have lots of people who have migrated from that part of the world. And so our incidence rate is really about the same as in Singapore and Vietnam, not as uh, high as Guangzhou. So this is actually a, a real problem in this area. 
This is caused by EBV as compared to HPV. And I just show you three slides of viruses you've all heard about. Our favorite one with the red uh, crown, corona, coronavirus, is actually a pretty small, simple virus. It's only uh, 30 KB big. That's sort of the length of the uh, 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 nucleotides in it. EBV is a monster compared to that. It's a hundred, if you just compare these roughly, think of these as generic units. It's 172 versus 30. HPV is even uh, smaller. So this is a big, complicated organism in the viral world. And because of that, it's tough to figure out how to vaccinate against it, among other things. And we really don't have a good vaccine. But here's some work that was done by my colleagues in Philadelphia. They said, well, let's look at the machinery of this virus. And so they looked at this protein that this virus produces called EBNA1, and they crystallized it. Crystallizing is a big deal because you can learn a lot about the structure of a protein. And when you know the structure of the protein, you can design little molecules that glom up the structure of the protein. That's most of what our small molecule medicines do, is they stick to some protein or some molecule and mess it up in some way. And so they did this at the Wistar Institute, uh, Paul Lieberman and uh, Troy Messick. And they came up with this drug called VK2019. So they're basic researchers. Um, they said, oh, great, let's go give it to people with EBV. And uh, they were looking for people. There are some EBV lymphomas, which are extraordinarily rare in the US. And I had heard about this through colleagues. And I said, no, you should be studying this in nasopharynx cancer, because EBV is the virus that drives nasopharynx cancer. We got together, we wrote a trial, we got funding for this trial, and this trial is now uh, open and running here at Stanford. Again, new molecule, uh, collaboration with people from many institutions, but being studied primarily here. So other interesting, cool strategies which people have wondered, would it work? Does it make sense to activate a virus in order to kill it? Well, it seems like if the virus is kind of dormant, you don't want to activate it. That sounds bad. Well, for anyone who's ever had a cold sore, you may know that that virus has typically been living in your body in a dormant phase in a nerve root someplace, and you really don't have any way to kill it. But when it's activated and it comes out and creates the cold sore, there are actually medicines that can kill the activated form of the virus. And you've probably heard of antiviral pills that people can take for cold sores. Well, what if we could do the same thing for EBV? And there's a strategy to do that. There's a drug called natinostat that takes the inactive EBV and turns it active. And then once it's active, we believe drugs like valgancyclovir may kill it. This is work done in collaboration with a company pursuing this strategy. So uh, we've dubbed this the kick, kill, kick, and kill um, things. Kind of a, a war-like metaphor. I'm not really into those metaphors too much, actually, especially these days. But that's sort of a unique strategy of paradoxically turning on something, because once it's on, it's easier to destroy. Again, in trials. This is a brief sample of the work that's being done in our program. There's lots of other things going on. I just highlighted a few. These are pictures of the faculty who are actively pursuing work here. I can tell you there's a lot of people that aren't on this slide that could be. There's nurses, nurse coordinators, APPs, research coordinators, speech language pathologists, a bunch of collaborators in labs, et cetera, that I just don't have space for. So it really does uh, take a huge group. And I have to say it's sort of interesting to hear Elisa describe you know, how exciting it is to come as a patient to be treated at Stanford. It's because of people on this slide that I find it so exciting to be here as a, a clinician and researcher. So thank you, everybody. Testing, testing. There we go. We do have time for a few questions. If anybody has any questions for Dr. Kalivas. I don't know. Is there a way? Are there online things coming at us, perhaps? No. Uh, I haven't seen any yet. But we have monitoring in the back for if there are any questions. Any questions online? What do you think are some? Oh, you got one. I just want to say thank you to 
uh, for the fact that you can explain cancer in such simple terms for us, and I'm very appreciative. I'm very appreciative of that. So thank you for, because it was very informative, and I feel like I get it, and I'm not a mes medical professional. So thank you. Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting thing. Um, I uh, uh, give all the trainees who come through our clinic uh, about a five-page paper that they're supposed to read over before they start in the clinic. Um, I call it the Calivas rant. Um, for those who know me, ranting can be kind of my specialty. Um, and one of the things that I say in that is, is my three favorite words are, I don't know. Um, and what I mean by that in terms of your comment is I think a lot of people hide behind fancy technical language uh, in order to avoid the raw truth that there's so much out there about what we're trying to treat that we don't know. And in a sense, uh, keeping it simple is a um, part of keeping it humble uh, because the cool thing, I mean, going back to that original outer space Taurus thing, um, you know, will we ever get there? Will we ever make those discoveries? I don't know. Um, but one of the first things you have to realize is uh, be honest about what you know and don't know. And part of that is, I think, keeping it simple. There's nothing more frustrating. Um, uh, I think you've seen this before. I actually, well, um, uh, I'm going to extend. I'm gonna, so there is something that I Google all the time to keep myself real. It's called a bull expletive deleted calculator. So if you Google that, there's this little button you can go through, and they flash up you know, word expressions like you know, synchronize projective harmonization, you know, meaningless expressions. And I, I, I really I think I'm going to add that to my rant that I want my trainees to look over that beforehand to realize there's so many people uh, who use doublespeak. Um, and uh, it's sort of a protective mechanism, but I don't think it's very helpful. And so thanks for that. I'll continue to try to keep it simple. Uh, thank you for your work again in the area of xerostomia. Uh, I am familiar with the D-limonene a little bit. I think I've tried it you know, post-protocol. Uh, but what about salogen during protocol? Uh, that's a saliva stimulator. Uh, I don't know if you've had much experience with that. And then my other question is, thank you for showing the, the COVID virus versus the HPV virus. I was thrilled to see that COVID does not lead to cancer in the slide there. Any other comments about what we know about COVID and its various variants and you know, compared to the HPV and all those variants that the HPV has? And again, a few of the HPV ones do cause cancer. And do we really know that much about the COVID variants? Thank you. That's a lot of questions. So, um, you know, uh, let's talk about things that have been tested to uh, deal with dry mouth after radiation. So. Um, there's a lot of things that have been tried. Keratinocyte growth factor, um, oral lubricants, um, superficial um, light therapy, which actually uh, does have some data that suggests it works. What you're talking about, uh, uh, salogen and another drug called civimoline, um, artificially stimulate saliva glands. They don't actually inherently protect the salivary glands during or after radiation. They just give an extra kick to what's left over after radiation. And the data suggest that in about one out of five patients, they'll tell you, yeah, that helped some. I can think of a particular patient of mine who um, uh, uh, has been on it for years. And when she runs out and forgets that there's no refills, she completely freaks out because it really, she says, I can't get through a day without it. Most people don't. So that's not really a preventer. I think what. Um, what they're hoping here is stem cell stimulation and preservation. That's sort of a, uh, a treatment that I think most people will find, a few people find effective. Uh, although in most people, not many side effects either. So a lot of people uh, uh, that I know who have problems that will at least try it and then say, man, eh, didn't do much for me. Wow, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 question, um, that's a big one. I am not a SARS-CoV-2 expert by any stretch of the imagination. 
I don't have any data now to suggest that that virus is going to cause malignancy. There are a ton of viruses out there that we're exposed to, you know, mild rhinoviruses, influenza viruses, which we really don't think have an impact uh, on that. Having said that, that virus has a huge impact on our cancer patients who are immune compromised. And I mean immune compromised by lowering blood counts, and I mean immune compromised by having irregular tissue in their mouth and throat uh, because of treatment. But I don't know of any data that uh, suggests uh, they lead to malignancy, but I'm not a world expert on that topic. So coming back to my three favorite words, I don't know. Thank you. Um, so I'm asking a question about amifostine because five years ago I was given it with some success, but I recently understood that uh, they stopped uh, thinking that it's of benefit uh, pre prior to um, radiation. I was just curious about your opinion. Yeah. Um, so amifostine is a challenge. So there's a couple of things that are interesting about what you said. Um, how do we measure success? So one of the things that, again, using the three favorite words, I don't know. If I give you a drug and you seem to feel better in a subjective way that's extremely hard to measure, how do I know that it was the drug that did it? The only way to do that is a big randomized trial and give people a fake pill versus amifostine or a fake injection versus amifostine or whatever, those sorts of trials. Those trials have been done with amifostine. And they have suggested some preservation of salivary flow. How much they have translated to patient perceived benefit is a big question mark. I read those data as being negative. And a number of people have challenges of getting amifostine along the way in terms of low blood pressure and side effects. So do I think amifostine has absolutely no activity in preserving salivary function? No, I don't. Do I think it's meaningful and useful enough to routinely uh, suggest to people? I don't. So, and I think you'll find that most people in my field have sort of voted that way, and we don't really give it. Um, uh, that wasn't to say it was a bad idea to give it. I think that um, we're all desperate to try something because you know you guys are the ones that are living with those consequences, not me. Um. All of us who are non-medical people now are more experts about vaccine than we'd like to be <laughs> in this era. But my question is, um, at this point in time, with the HPV vaccine, do you have enough data or enough years, really, um, between the time that was developed and given, and then how, how, is, that, um, how is that playing out today? Do we know yet how uh, effective it is? So. It depends upon how you measure it, and it depends upon how strict you are about defining benefit. I try to think about good metaphors here. So um, if I have something that I know prevents a little bit of rust development on my fender, do I know that it will uh, uh, prevent my fender from rusting through? What the heck am I talking about? I'm going to get myself down some weird dead end metaphor here. Sorry. So what I mean is human papillomavirus vaccines were, have never been shown to prevent cancer. Please don't quote me on that out of context. What they have shown is they prevent pre-cancer. There is no precancer lesion that we can track in oropharynx cancer. But we can track precancer lesions in cervical cancer. That's what pap smears are all about. Pap smears are not about diagnosing cancer. Pap smears are about diagnosing precancer. So all of the large randomized controlled trials with um, HPV vaccines were done for cervical cancer, and they showed a dramatic decrease in precancer 
of people who are vaccinated. I mean, we're talking like a decrease to pretty much zero. We know in cervical cancer that of the people who have precancer, if it's not treated, a certain fraction of those go on to develop cancer, well established over many, 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 many years. And so that's the basis of FDA approval. The problem with oropharynx cancer is we think the latency may be a decade or two or three. So no drug company and no researcher is going to say, I'm going to do a randomized controlled trial and vaccinate 10,000 people and give dummy vaccines to another 10,000 and track them 50 years from now to see who got oropharynx cancer. Just not practical. But there's some other really, really good surrogate markers. So uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Maura Gillison, um, she's an oncologist at MD Anderson, done some really interesting work in this study. Someone I was talking to about other work she'd done. So um, she collected some data from something called NHANES, which is a CDC study of quality of life, what's going on, risks for all kinds of different diseases. And that's a huge study. And part of it, they collect blood and saliva on people who aren't necessarily patients. So Maura said, hey, can I have a little bit of that saliva and can I test it for HPV? And she did. And she found out in the general US population at any given time, 7% of them have some serotype of HPV in their saliva. Wow, that's, that's a lot of HPV out there. Now, one question you might ask is, well, how come 7% of the population doesn't get cancer? There's a Nobel Prize in that answer. <laughs> What's the answer today? I don't know. Um, but here's something that she did to follow up on that work, which is really cool. So she said, I want to collect saliva from people that I know have been vaccinated against HPV versus saliva on people which haven't been vaccinated against HPV. She found virtually no HPV in saliva of people who had been vaccinated. Now, there's, there's some details there. There's HPV serotypes that are risk of causing cancer and serotypes, not just like all these corona variants. It's interesting. The language is interesting. We call them serotypes for HPV. We call them variants for coronavirus. I don't know why, but they're the same thing. But that's pretty powerful data. You know, suddenly you've eliminated this whole risk of cancer. If you don't have HPV, you're not going to get HPV cancer. That's pretty clear. And she's shown that there aren't that 7% of carriers out there. So that's the kind of evidence that we have. You know, the, the longer term question, I just don't think we're ever going to get the answer to.